So how many people here own a Kinect? Cool. And do you remember what the setup experience was like? Was it exceedingly difficult? Not too bad? Easy? Pretty good? Okay. Well, um, we, we may have had a, a small part of that in, in the user research in making it a pretty good or, or good experience. Um, and w are other people here gamers or um, get a couple gamers back here? Um, user researchers, PMs, what? Writers, UX people, designers. Okay. All right. So um, I'll tell a story basically how a small Blink team and Xbox team systematically conducted the in-home research, kind of what we learned from this guy um, and others like him. He's kind of crouched. You can't really see his bare feet, but he's crouched rather golem-like in, in his living room, um, pouring over a quick start guide there. And, um, and then I'll, I'll go through some examples of how the Xbox designers and developers really responded to the findings from the field research to make um, a good experience, setup experience even better. And I can't claim, I, I want to throw out a couple disclaimers. First of all, that the presentation has been um, vetted up through Microsoft and hopefully I won't be revealing any, any proprietary information. They wouldn't like that very much. So I can't talk too, too much in detail about everything we did. But um, another aspect of this is when we do research out in the field, we're taking photos of people, we're taking videos of people and we make agreements with people that we don't disclose their personal information. So a lot of the photos, a lot of the video I'm gonna show um, has pictures where faces plotted out and I'm showing backs of people. So we can't, you can't, you hopefully, if you, none of your friends will show up or relatives or anything like that. Um, and then I, I wanna say that I didn't personally design the Kinect. I'm, I wish I could take credit for that or for any of the games, the Kinect games, but I can't, um, uh, unfortunately. But um, anyway, that's, those are a couple things I wanted to mention. So when it was launched uh, two and a half years ago, Connect units sold fast enough to make the Guinness Book of World Records for the fastest selling ever consumer electronics device. It got really high reviews, and even now it's still, if, if you believe Amazon reviews, it's still um, you know, four and a half stars or so. It's a really popular consumer electronics device. And Microsoft just announced a couple weeks ago that um, the sales had reached 24 million. So as a user researcher, it's pretty gratifying knowing, knowing that you had an impact that affected that, that many people. So that's, that's quite a large number. Um, and just for some context, you know, the Nintendo Wii broke a lot of new ground with motion-based gaming um, using the Wiimote or the handheld wand. But Kinect really took this to the next level. And by getting rid of the handheld controller completely and letting users play just using gestures and and movements and by tracking their skeletons um, and uh, body movements. So my, Microsoft prepped everyone for the release with the message that you are the controller. You are the controller. And the, the photos I just ran here um, are from promo images and you notice that they're of, of families and kids and, and that's um, an audience that prior to the Kinect release hadn't really been um, targeted by Xbox. So this was a, a new audience for, the, for Microsoft. And so when you think about traditional Xbox games, you think about the, the franchises like Halo or Call of Duty, Grand Theft Auto, some of the first person shooters or role playing games. You don't really think about, at least a few years ago, you didn't think about family friendly games like, like uh, Connect Sports or Dance Central, Dance Revolution or Connectimals. Um, and, and so that was a whole different you know, paradigm shift. And now we're seeing a few games that appeal to more of that core gaming audience, that original gaming audience. But uh, my point is that this, this first release really targeted. They had a whole new group of people that they were trying to bring into that Xbox experience. So that was one of the key questions is how, in the research, is how would that audience respond to this device and could they use it effectively? Could they do the setup effectively? So we recruited a lot of families to participate in the in-home research, as well as a lot of people from the other audiences, the other persona types that the, the Xbox group had. So I want to roll, I'll roll a few videos and just to kind of give you an idea of how people responded um, to the, the technology once they had it set up in their homes.
Yeah, so that's, a, that's kind of the magic part of Connect, and you, and you don't, you know, the, the goal, one of the goals of the, the design team um, was to really get people into this, sort of this magical experience as quickly as possible and get them um, through the setup, through the, the connecting of the wires, through the software setup as, as fast as possible to, to get to this kind of experience. Because they knew that this experience was going to be, you know, really positive, really immersive and, and um, interesting for people. So you've got the new audience, you've also got a new piece of hardware, a couple new pieces of hardware actually. So Connect when it first came out um, was released as a standalone sensor like you see here. It was also bundled with a new console, the Xbox 360S. So we, um, when we took these into people's homes, we took both the individual Connect um, and had people that were used to Xbox 360 already setting that up, and we took the whole bundle, so it was a brand new system. So that's how it looks like in the promo pictures. This is more of what it looks like in, you know, we call it the Christmas morning scenario where um, you've got mayhem in the house and the kids have just opened a present, they pulled it all out, and you've got the controller of the Xbox, or the, uh, yeah, the controller of the Xbox, the, all the cords, the, the game, and the kids, and dog barking, and, and everything happening, and, and everybody just wants to play as quickly as possible. So some of the research questions, as a researcher, you know, it, it's always interesting. We, we defined a lot of things up front. We had so many questions we were interested in. Uh, but when we began to collaborate with the Xbox teams, um, there was still a lot of, they had done a ton of testing in the labs, they'd done a ton of research on this, but there's still a lot of questions that they didn't quite know um, how, how the product would go over. And so what would, you know, what would that first out-of-box setup be like? What would the first user experience be like? Would this non-traditional audience of gamers be able to set it up and get playing quickly? Would users understand the, the gestural interaction? We just had a conversation at lunch about this. Is how, how did we get people, how did they get, Microsoft get people to understand the gestures? Um, what would happen in the uncontrolled family settings with kids jumping around, pets getting in the way, et cetera? And would people, would people understand this concept of a play space? So you've got an invisible boundary that's a few, you know, a few feet back from the connect, a few feet to either side that you can actually jump around and play in. Would people understand that? How do you communicate that in the software? And um, in addition to this, we had questions about international markets. We, we knew that you know, a lot of testing had been done in the US, but internationally, how would this technology go over? What are some of the constraints with home sizes, apartment sizes, and so on that might affect the experience of the product? So as I mentioned, it was part of a, a large R&D effort at Microsoft that involved what I heard is, is thousands of users um, overall. And um, so this, the in-home testing that we did in 200 homes was just a, a small part of this effort. But they had a, a long tail of technology research building up to product concept, the product concept. And I imagine they did a ton of market research, focus group testing um, to get sort of the, the product developed and then, and then prototyping with hardware, software, and they had to rela release an SDK for game developers, and, and all of this went on sort of before we were involved, but um, we, we became involved in April 2010, the product launch was in November 2010, so we had about seven months where we did this research, and I have to say that there's still a ton of, of areas that we were able to influence, and, and I'll give some examples of those as I go through the talk today, but, um, there were still a lot of active. There was still a lot of active work going on on the hardware. Um, the hardware was mostly baked, but um, some of the, the connections for the hardware were still in, in flux. As was the, uh, the firmware for the hardware products and, and the software, obviously the games, packaging, documentation, all of that was still in the works. So we spent, as I mentioned, eight months testing. We went to 14 different cities. Um, in six different countries. And I think the way to think about this research is as an iterative um, process, because every time we went out in the field we, in, in a different wave, um, we had a new software build, we had a new combination of hardware. When we first went out, there were test boxes, text boxes, and sometimes we had to take two or three boxes actually into each home, because a box wouldn't, it, it wasn't a, a um, integrated system yet. Each box would do something slightly different. So we had to set one up and then, and then dismantle it, or have, have the user set it up, dismantle it, set up another one, and so on. So it was, it was quite a um, uh, logistical 
um, exercise, just getting all the equipment into people's homes and, and testing. That was at the beginning. At the end, things became integrated and, and much more streamlined. So Seattle was our base. Um, Blink is located right here in Seattle, obviously, and, and Microsoft is just across the drink over on the east side. So we tested a lot in the Puget Sound area, but also branched out in other areas of the US. Um, Paris, Dijon, France, Hamburg, Germany, uh, Manchester, England, London, and Tokyo. So we wanted to see a wide contrast of housing types from kind of the, the typical maybe US suburban home to older homes where the rooms might be darker and smaller, so we have these lighting issues and, and other things, physical uh, properties and homes that we were curious about as well. And um, <coughs> You know, I, I prefer to go to places like, like Paris, uh, where I could go to homes with flowers, where I could sip espresso with the participant and have a croissant. And, and my colleagues, um, you know, I'd send the outskirts of Denver and, and uh, <laughs> home with, uh, you can't really see the skull and crossbones or Confederate, Confederate flag in the window, but you get the idea. And, um, you know, you don't quite know what you're going. Marcus, our camera person here, and he's helped me with some of these studies. And, and uh, you don't quite know exactly what you're getting until you drive up to the place. And I like to say that um, you know it's real user research when you can smell what was for breakfast or smell what's for dinner. And, and sometimes it, that means um, you know smelling a person's pets. And I won't go into any any more gross <laughs> things than that, or their socks or something like that. But um, you, you just meet a. a great variety of people, and we deliberately targeted actually a lot of people, uh, people in a lot of different um, demographic segments, income strata, and, and so on. So we really wanted to see how a broad audience would respond to this product. Um, obviously, we, you know, single family homes are very important, especially in the US, but we wanted to see how uh, the product would, would do in places like these row houses in Manchester, England, or um, these are, uh, UK term is council flats, but this is this is a uh, government housing in Paris, and that um, that's just a view from the train in Tokyo. So a lot of uh, multifamily homes as well. We saw quite a few surprises along the way. Like this is a place in the outskirts of Tokyo on the right, where um, where the the father of the home had a barber shop below, and we tested our test participant was actually the son, and we set it up. Up, up above, and he really liked the product and everything, but he said, oh, I love it, but I just can't jump on the floor because my my dad is, is um, shaving people with a straight edge razor <laughs> down below. Uh, and, and I just don't want to, you know, don't want to surprise him. You can fill in the blanks there. You don't want to surprise him. Um, so, you know, the outside of homes is important, but really what we're interested in is, is the interior spaces. and. Uh, U.S. suburban home, you've got lots of room to, you know, the Connect excels in this sort of environment where you can set it, the Connect in a variety of different places. You can detect people really, it can detect people really easily. The product does very well. This this is a home in France um, with a family, with an adult um, son who was our participant. They had a lot of room. They could move things. They were, they were great. Um, that was a great session. But then what happens when, you know, you've got more constrained spaces like this, this bachelor pad in Tokyo. Um, it's got its manga collection all over the place, and you had a couple futons there. Only you know, there's another futon over here, and really limited space. Um, and so it's a bit more challenging. The product the product has constraints, and it doesn't perform quite as well. In this case, it, it actually he was able to get it working. He ended up jumping on this this other futon to get it to work, and he liked it enough, but um, but uh, to, to get it working really well. We were interested in. Uh, where people would place the connect, and then you know most people have most homes have something like a, a ottoman or a coffee table. Um, you know this one happens to be pretty heavy. We we're wondering, you know, would people move those things on their own, and and um, would the software and Quick Start Guide effectively communicate that that they needed to create a space? And then what happens when you can't move something easily, like a fish tank? How would that affect the product and the product experience? And what kinds of investments do people already have in gaming equipment? So we've got Rock Band and Wii and all kinds of stuff, and Xbox and a lot of homes you see that have uh, where they have multiple gaming systems already. A lot of investment, a lot of money tied up in that. And 
So how did Connect fit into to that sort of environment? And were there physical connections available? And, and here, the dirty secret in all our homes, or a lot of our homes, is all the, the spaghetti and the mess of wiring in the back and the cabling. And you, you know, you take pictures, we go out and take pictures of that. But, um, but you know, would people be able to just you know, physically wire and, and connect and, and fit it up um, in, a, in an elegant way? So the testing approach we used, um, the testing approach we used was, was the same, regardless of the iteration. We spent about two hours in each home, and we be began by interviewing people in their main TV or entertainment area. Um, then we would give them the box. Um, we would pack it up, even when it was in prototype state, we would pack up the box as though it were um, to the specs of the pack that the packaging team provided. So it was pretty realistic that you know the, the quick start guide would be on top and then the connect and the other wiring would be, the, the wires would be under that in a specific order. So we really wanted to check that that, that order made sense to people. Um, so we didn't do a lot of, um, it, aside from the instances when I talked about earlier where we had multiple Xboxes that we needed to bring in the home, we, we didn't intervene a lot. We just did a lot of observation. We would give, you know, we, we explained the purpose of the product in, in a very limited way, what it would do for them, um, and then gave them the boxes and let them go at it. And they, they knew that, you know, this was a, a two-hour session and, and that they would be doing something um, that involved gaming. So basically, we were there to know where something confusing happened when they were blocked, um, and then just observing the, the social dynamics, what happens when a mom and, and her son um, get together, and, and how are they, you know, and these, these types of sessions were, were really interesting, the social um, exchanges and, and how uh, people would explain the product to each other and how it would be set up. And, and that was some of our, I think the, the when there were multiple people involved in a family, that were, those were some of the more interesting sessions. So in addition to the physical setup, there's a digital setup. This was an earlier prototype of uh, digital setup that people would need to go through. And this is the first time that they would um, experience gesturing. And so um, there were a lot of different iterations of what, what types of, you can see, you may not be able to see, but a, an avatar here. And um, so there were, lots of starts and stops on what would be most effective for the gesture and, and um, progressing through screens. And again, we were just there observing, noting where problems would occur. This is another prototype of the, um, of the setup. So after, um, after they had selected language, the setup was complete, then the, the program, the software would go straight into the initial game. And so we tested a few different games out in the field. This is um, the one that was eventually uh, built into the product, which is River Rush or Connect Adventures. It's another family in France. Um, and as the summer progressed the, into fall, we had other games like Connect Sports and this guy was actually a light in Minnesota somewhere, um, Minneapolis or, or uh, St. Paul. And he was actually a lightweight boxer, so it was kind of interesting to get his feedback on, on Connect. And he said it was, it was pretty realistic, you know, there wasn't a lot of latency, so he, he had a pretty good time. So in addition to um, the physical digital first game experience, we also were interested just in a lot of measurements within people's homes. Um, so how big was their play space? What, you know, did that, we tried to correlate the size of play space with any problems we saw or, or obstacles that were in the way. So we did a lot of just physical measurements and diagramming. Um, we looked at, you know, we did room sketches just to show the lighting, things like fireplace locations relevant to the, rel relevant to the uh, relative to the TV and the sensor, the connect sensor, that sort of thing. So just so you don't think that user research is it's all easy, I don't know if you can see this, but um, wow. kind of sweat through the khakis here. And the the, 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 the pulling up the thermometer is 96 degrees. There's there's a um, we got this was in Japan. And it was a small studio apartment. We arrived, and she was participant was was very apologetic. She said, "Oh my my uh, AC has just broken," and it was 
know, this is the middle of summer in Tokyo, and humidity is what you know, 99%, and it's really, really hot. There's a uh, a local news guy here in Seattle, um, King Five, named Jim Foreman, and they always send him out to the in the big weather events and up to the top of the Space Needle when it's 50 mile an hour winds or out in somewhere where there's a flood and you see him in his Gore-Tex. And, and so I'm, I'm sort of, my wife and I joke that I'm sort of the, the Jim Foreman of user research. <laughs> so um, we, we also took a really iterative, um, responsive approach to the research. And um, as I mentioned, the setup software changed weekly, but one of the things that we could control, or we had another area where we had some impact was just on the quick start guides themselves. We would observe through sessions, um, you know, how people were using the, and consuming the diagrams. Um, and if something didn't work, we'd literally go back to the hotel at night with, with uh, scissors and start cutting things up and repositioning graphics and text. And um, then go out the next, the next day and test that again or sometimes the next week. And, and we were in contact and in, in, um, consulting with the user assistance writers, and, and so they were sort of aware of what we were doing. But um, the, diagram, or the photo on the right we call it the, the wall of shame. And the um, reason we did that, it, it was a, an attempt to tell people how to make a particular <coughs> hardware connection. And we tried about eight or 10 different iterations of these diagrams. And they're, they're the little tags you see on, on cords. And of course, um, maybe not so obvious, it wasn't obvious to anybody at the beginning anyway, but most of the time we ignore those things. They're just warnings, right? They're just things like this contains high voltage. You know, you're gonna shock yourself if you put it in the bathtub or whatever. You just learn to ignore those things. And of course, almost to a person, every single user, regardless of the color, the, um, w whether there's a stop sign on it or anything, people just sort of, it off. Um, and so there was we, there was a different solution that um, that the uh, dev team came up with to address the problem, which was to actually pre-connect the hardware in the um, in the box, which is a, a a very painful and costly decision to make. And at the end of, of uh, after everything had already been spec'd out, but after they did that, we saw zero problems. And before that, almost everybody <coughs> had a problem making this simple connection. So I'll go through a few other examples of optimizing the, um, the user experience, the first use experience. And the things I want to talk about were that packaging and quick start guides made a, a tremendous difference in the, the initial UX. Um, things became really interesting when people set up the product together, especially families. And because of those unique requirements, um, connect, the setup needed to communicate in, in very particular ways to get people to, um, to do what they need to do. So this one, let's start with packaging. I'll kind of, I love this, this uh, video, so I'll let it speak for itself. It's tougher than it is to actually hook it up. Uh, can you talk about the packaging and opening the package? I would rip it. <laughs> it is not the boxing was not easy to open. Okay. I would have just ripped. I would have well, I would have taken a knife, cut it. Just cut it open. I would have, I would have cut it open. If I knew it was mine, I, I'm keeping it. I would have just taken a kitchen knife, cut the boxes, and been into it. Okay, on both of them. On both of them. Okay. The second one was just as hard as the first one. Okay. So that little, whatever it was, 20 second clip had an enormous impact. Because um, obviously it's not a good idea if people are taking their kitchen knives <laughs> and ripping through boxes. So, uh, and prior to this we had seen actually a lot of other users have difficulty just getting the, the connect box open as it was spec. And so the problem was that you can see on the left, it had a little notch, and you're supposed to find the notch and lift it out, and then open the box. And, and um, so, and people weren't weren't discovering that. So the solution was to cut a larger arc in the box. And again, 
after that happened, after that change was made, which was costly, which was difficult, which involved a lot of fighting back at Microsoft, um, we didn't see any problems anymore. So that's what actually shifted. So in terms of family and social dynamics, um, setup needs to be performed by one person standing about six feet back from the sensor, from the Kinect sensor. And others need to get out of the way. But what happened was that once people saw themselves being uh, projected on a TV, it was like uh, sort of a house of mirrors. Everybody jumped in and wanted to be part of it, right? And so uh, that became kind of messy. And then, and then, so then it became a further challenge to try to explain to people that, no, it, you, you have to get out of the way. So let's see here. This is a family out in, um, somewhere out in the outskirts of Seattle in, in Maple Valley, I think. Whoa. Nice. We talked about, um, or I mentioned the different gesturing styles, and so, you know, on top of everything else, just remember this is a novel system introducing a whole new interaction language, right? And so what we observed were people gesturing in very unique ways. Some would use, you know, kind of a fist. We, we call it fists of fury. Um, the, the, the Vulcan salute came up a couple times, and um, you know, a lot of pointing and, and just waving in, in different ways. So that was a, a huge challenge that needed to be overcome. I'll give you another favorite video clip here of, of a guy in his um, gesturing style and, and a bit of his reaction to the product. Okay, so Even though that that's not obviously the, the best way of, of uh, experiencing the product, so I'm going to show what what uh, eventually became the setup, and just note some of the instructions to stand up, stand alone, put down the controller, how how they communicated to clear the area, and again, and standing in front of the sensor. And I wish I could take credit for some of these, but I thought that the designers at Microsoft did a really nice job of communicating communicating all of these things. Are. 
And that's it. I mean, they, we started with, you know, there were a couple of approaches to make the, to sort of gamify the, the setup experience and make that a little bit more immersive, a little bit more engaging and fun, but really, um, and it worked for, for a lot of people, but it didn't work for, for a lot of other people. And so the common denominator became this very short um, but, but direct setup experience that just got the job done um, very nicely, very quickly. So in terms of the, the research itself, you know, we brought back a lot of unique data insights from the field that, um, that the Xbox teams weren't seeing in their, their labs. They did a great amount of testing, but the field research really brought back some, some things that were unique in different ways. Um, and the, the audience there, the, the dev and design and dev teams were very receptive and built a lot of changes into the, the first um, release of the product. So some of the things that, that the field testing influenced were just the retail packaging, as you saw in the previous example, the quick start guides, the digital setup, the choice of, an, uh, of the first game. And, and this is an area where the international research, at least in Japan, might have, we might have had a different recommendation there because um, there was a lot more sensitivity in Japan about, making, about jumping on the floor and making uh, noise that might disrupt neighbors. So, um, but the, the river, raft, river rush game, you can, you can play it without jumping a lot. You do jump, and, and that was a concern that, um, that you know, if this were solely a product for Japan, it may have been, there may have been a different choice in introductory games. Um, the research also influenced how play space was, connect, was communicated, and uh, this is what the design team came up with. And then finally, the, or, or not finally, but the Connect Tuner troubleshooting tool was something we also tested in the process. And by identifying problems and obstacles through the field research, we helped the support team um, anticipate some of the issues that they may have once the product was released, and they could, they could then build in troubleshooting content and topics um, that would address some of those issues. So I kind of wanted to generalize, and maybe we can leave a couple minutes here for questions as well, but just generalizing, you know, why do in-home testing or where it fits in with other research methods. And um, it's not a trivial thing to do. It's not, a, it's not an inexpensive thing to do. It involves a lot of effort. Uh, but sort of along the spectrum of, of, you know, things being completely out of context or things being in context, and then um, self-report Reporting, so you have, and, and you know, actually observing people doing things. Self-reporting could be, you know, bringing people in for focus groups and or taking surveys. And none of these, you know, I'm not knocking any of these methods. They all have their place, and and we certainly use all of them. But um, you know, one-on-one -on -one interviews, you're kind of getting closer to observing people in in the context of use. Uh, beta testing is great, it's done in the actual context, but we don't have the, uh, you know, the ability to observe people doing beta testing a lot. Uh, probably an ideal you know, would be to be uh, an ethnographer or, or um, video of ethnography where you could do some pure observation, um, but we couldn't do that for this product. It, wasn't, it, wasn't, it didn't fit the, the research <coughs> questions or goals. So, in-home testing and usability testing is great. We can do a lot of simulation in the lab. We can set up a pretty realistic environment um, and bring people in to, to try something out. But we're not actually getting all the variables that we found in people's homes and all the things that I haven't shown, like the, the pets barking and, and um, you know, people arguing about setup and, and all of those sorts of things. So um, the in-home testing was a really nice way to get at a lot of information that we couldn't get elsewhere, but it wasn't being done elsewhere through other research. <laughs> So why, why do it internationally? I was just in London a few weeks ago um, on a different project, and, and you know, we know that, that you don't tip as much in the UK, right? And, uh, and I suppose, it, I also, when I go to different cities, I also go running, so this is out running in a, in a park near where our hotel was. And, um, and, I, and presumably you don't want to litter in a park, but, but no, tip, no tipping or litter together. I, you know, <laughs> I really needed a cultural informant to tell me exactly what that meant. I, I don't I don't know. I you know it, it probably has something to do with 
tipping garbage cans or animals? I, I don't know. So this is why you go to other places, just to, to get that insight and, and uh, information. So kind of the, the approach um, for testing with real people in real, setting, in real settings, one of the approaches is just to embrace, every, not everything's controlled, so you can't control it. it, it it's like, um, it's not like a usability lab, but you learn a lot through those uncontrolled instances and environments. Um, you can't recruit for, you know, predict when somebody's going to jump up on their couch, but it's, it's certainly interesting to see that. You might actually learn something from it. On the product, you know, and, and I'm talking about any product here, not just Connect, it doesn't need to be completely baked. You can take out prototypes, you can take out other studies we've just taken out little form models and <coughs> ask people, where would you put this? Or how would you put this in with your existing equipment? Um, same with software, you can always do a Wizard of Oz kind of ex experiment. Um, and you know, we, we tried to recruit, we had a lot of recruiting questions, we tried to screen people very carefully um, for key characteristics, but we didn't try to match people exactly to the personas that Microsoft had developed. We, we, um, we, we looked at demographics, we looked at key characteristics we wanted to recruit for, but, um, but it's almost impossible to recruit for an exact persona type. Some of the things that we do, just in general, going out in the home, we try to reduce the fear factor by sending, in advance, we, we send photos of ourselves um, to participants so they know who to expect and how many people that are going to be showing up in their homes. Um, we try to build on trust relationships that market, re market research companies already have with participants. So these are, the people we use for this research are paid, right? So they're paid study participants for the most part. And um, they have a, if I'm going to Austin or I'm going to Raleigh or, 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 uh, or Paris or Dijon, I, I can work with a company there that has already established a working relationship with <coughs> participants for the study. So I represent, I show up at their house and, and I, I might, I, I don't usually say I'm from Blink or I'm even, um, I'm from Microsoft. I might say I'm here for the you know, market research firm X study. And, um, or if, if we reveal who the study is for, we might mention, you know, I'm here for the Xbox study, that sort of thing. We try to be a good guest when we're in people's homes. We don't wander around. We don't make disparaging remarks about their furniture or their children or their art. Um, we respect boundaries. This is an example of when I decided not to respect a boundary because I really like this guy. Um, the fact that he had his gamer tag um, tattooed on his arm, and so I said, I gotta get a photo of that. Good. Uh, so some of the, I think the success factors for this particular project, we, you know, in, in thinking about any project or trying to um, institute UX more in your organization is, is really the importance of a UX champion. And we had a champion at a high, fairly high level in the Xbox organization. Um, this is a photo of Mohammed Shakari. And um, he owned a lot of the hardware user experience and he made, he made sure that teams acted on the results. So I think he was really instrumental in the fact that there was such a great uptake of the results from this study back at, at Microsoft. Um, one of the ways he was able to do that was he had a really great PM on, on his side that handled um, all, getting all the information from our field work into the bug tracking system. Um, you know, they provided us with the hardware, the logistical support, so we didn't have to worry about somebody building the product and getting us, it to us. We, we could focus on what we did best as a consulting team, um, which was getting out in the field and interacting with users. And then the PM and the, the folks back at Microsoft could set up the meetings and, and we would go over and meet with teams, but all the groundwork for that was taken care of. So it was really ideal actually to have a great PM. Uh, we built up a great research team both here and with our contacts at Microsoft and you know to develop the research questions and uh, and also when we went to other cities and other places we have a network of partners and uh, and I found that working with great partners like the guy on the right um, was was really fundamental in, in getting the work done. So in terms of reporting, we, we modified that as we went along. Um, oh, it's done here. And we, we tried to uh, keep the reporting. We started with kind of a standard approach where we'd go out and then come back and write a report. Well, there wasn't time for that. So we kept the reporting really lightweight. We sometimes, uh, 
reported findings through email that we saw start to see a trend in a particular iteration. You know, three people experienced this so far. All three did X, Y, or Z, and uh, and then we found that video worked really effectively in in communication back at, in Redmond. So you know, oftentimes we'd be out researching all day. We'd go back to the hotel at night and just um, start generating video clips and then upload those over SharePoint and get those back to, to Microsoft. Um, we, we went after we get back from a a city, we would do a top line findings report sort of a day after report, and then we would meet um, over at Microsoft to triage the, the report and then communicate findings to teams that needed to, to hear about it. Uh, and I think another success factor was just the flexibility. Um, you know, as researchers, you kind of maybe go into a project and want things to stay the same so you can see what happens with a lot of different subjects. Here, it was, there was really, we had to be, um, much more agile and flexible and change things and, and understand that things change from week to week and just sort of design a new study um, almost every time we went out. Around, I mean, you know, it's all about connect, right? So things, a lot of things stay the same, but, um, but we were always testing new things as we went to. And I think with that, um, there might be a couple minutes. Are you starting it? Uh, you're good. Good? Okay. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to 